Ron Richards is here to talk Xbox on Windows 10, Apple Watch 2, and a little bit about Android. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 362 for Thursday, June 18th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all of the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Joining us today to talk about the tech news is Ron Richards, host of All About Android. Welcome, Ron. How's it going? It's going well. So you've been following the news from E3, as you said before, the news that you care about, which is... Do, yeah, do my best. <laughs> a lot comes out of this show. It's a very busy show. Yeah. So what are the most interesting stories so far? Well, of course, I, you know, I'm, when looking at the E3 news, I'm looking for what's relevant in terms of, uh, you know, Android, specifically the Android platform, because that's kind of the area that I'm kind of most to. But I also, you know, I like to play Xbox. I like, you know, I like games. So I like to keep my eye on things. Um, I was really excited to see the news um, from Bethesda of Fallout 4 uh, being announced. But what I thought was really interesting is seeing a integration of Fallout 4 coming out along with companion mobile apps. So the idea being that, you know, you buy this great video game, but then there are, you know, uh, apps that run on your phone or, or extensions of the game that take you away from the console um, and continue the experience on your phone, which I think is super cool. Yeah, I played a little bit of the Fallout Shelter on uh, my iPad. Did they have one for Android, I'm assuming, also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, have you been playing it? Um, I actually haven't been playing it because I've been busy, but it's on my plan for this weekend. So I'm going to check it out because I love the Fallout series. So um, It is cool. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. more cartoonish, but yeah. um, I st I'd still like it. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that like and, and like th things like the um, extending the Pip-Boy into into a mobile app that you can have as well, too. I mean, like those are neat little ways to extend the brand into, um, it, you know, beyond just when you're playing the game. It, it follows you throughout the day. It's, you know, it's the kind of thing where, you know, on your commute or, you know, kind of just kind of um, uh, casual gaming keeps you in that world and makes you even that much more excited to go play the game when you when you get home. So I think that's that's pretty smart. And it's interesting to see how gaming is expanding beyond just the count uh, uh, beyond the consoles and to our phones and to our tablets and things like that right so earlier this week I and mean, we just talked about xbox and microsoft announced that you'd be able to play xbox 360 games on xbox one and today we heard another big announcement you'll be able to stream xbox one games on windows 10 uh what does this mean exactly well, yeah, so you'll be able to stream both Xbox One games as well as Xbox 360 games on the Windows 10. And basically, it's it's the connecting of the Xbox One platform to the Windows 10 platform. Um, so the idea that you'll be able to access, you know, the the Xbox dashboard, your friends, the whole, you know, kind of activities and all that sort of stuff, um, as well as the streaming elements that they announced and play the games on Windows. And what this does is this kind of gives it, gives Xbox One a leg up over PlayStation 4. And that's really what it boils down to. It's the war between Xbox One and PlayStation 4, you know, a lot of people say PlayStation 4 is the superior console, but you add in the the power of Windows behind Xbox One and it becomes much more interesting in that, again, you can extend that experience off of the console and onto a laptop, onto, onto a home PC um, and be able to get a lot of the functionality that before you could only get on the platform, on the console, so. Yeah, I mean, Microsoft was making announcements all over the place. They also had the yep. Minecraft demo. I don't know if you watched any of that, but that was very cool. Yeah, I I did one. That was one of the things that I thought was really um, interesting about the whole show in general was that um, you know we hadn't seen a lot about VR at all at the show. I was kind of surprised. I thought VR would be a bigger a bigger thing. But today I'm just seeing, and I'm not I'm not at, in LA at the show. I'm, I'm watching from home. But today I'm seeing a lot of people getting to play with the Hololens, specifically getting to play with with Minecraft, um, and you know, and and starting to get that taste of what the of Minecraft on uh, with Microsoft and throw in Hololens could potentially be, and it's going to be pretty special so yeah i mean i guess that's how the conference really goes there's a lot of sitting through press events and then the rest is just playing the games yeah the, the good stuff <laughs> yeah that, that, that seems like the fun part i mean i've never been to an e3 i've been i've been in la during e3 but i've never actually gotten inside to it but it seems that uh for my friends like jeff canada and and uh some other folks who are at the show it seems you know the, the press events are the ones that, that are the big kind of you know similar to when we talked about google io the big kind of event that everyone watches and it's kind of a you know kind of a uh audience member kind of thing but the participating and getting on the floor and actually playing the games seems to be a blast and seeing what people have um that they brought to the show 
Um, you know, a, Sony showed a little bit of Project Morpheus, their VR thing, but not that much. Of course, Oculus Rift was there as well as the um, Val, uh, Valve kind of offerings in terms of VR. Um, but I just thought VR would be a bigger presence at the show this year, given everything that we've seen this year, and it, it wasn't. So, What do you think of the Microsoft partnering with Oculus? To, to stream their games through VR. It makes, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, if I, I mean, you know, yes, Microsoft is is um, is developing the Hololens, and I'm really excited about that technology. But um, you, you want to have as Microsoft in the in you know in the realm in the reign of Satya running uh, Microsoft, they want to work with everybody. So, um, you know, if you've got Oculus Rift and it's a platform that really lends itself to the power of a PC that a PC's processor can bring, um, why not have it work with Windows? I think that just opens up the door to even more virtual reality opportunities. Right. And one thing I didn't hear at all about was Magic Leap, the Google-backed VR. Yep. Did you hear any announcements? No, nothing. <laughs> they just yeah. pop up in the news cycle every once in a while, just like, look, mm -hmm. we're going to make something, and then you never really see it. Yeah, but I don't really feel like E3 is a Google show. You know, even if Google had something going on in VR with either Magic Leap or with Cardboard, they're they're not going to do it at E3 because it's not there. It's not in their wheelhouse. They're, they're going to let let Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo and all those companies do their thing, and micro and Google can go off and do a big event somewhere else and get uh, even more attention. So right. So, is there any other E3 news that you're excited about? I got to admit, Star Wars Battlefront. That's that's the one that I'm kind of like, ooh, it's kind of it's kind of hitting my uh, hitting my fan button there as a Star Wars fan. I was watching the the videos this morning and stuff like that, and the the gameplay just looks amazing. Again, it looks like you know the game that we've always been waiting for, and we just hope that it delivers and isn't disappointing. So. When is there a release date for that? Oh, I forget. It's too, isn't it later this year? I think. Yeah, but um. Uh, no, but some some of that gameplay footage, which we you know, the thing is, is that we saw some footage. Um, earlier and we, everyone wondered if it was actually gameplay footage or not at E3 they showed the gameplay foot, footage and it just you know it just it just is amazing it looks like it comes out um when is it coming out oh that's the wrong date looks like November 17 2015 that's what it's coming out so uh, we just got to wait a little longer but everybody that I everybody I saw um that was at the show that got to play it or got to see it had nothing but uh, good things to say about it so Great. Well, I think there's one more day, so there might be some more surprises, I guess, tomorrow. We'll see. So earlier this week, we heard about the bug in the pre-installed SwiftKey keyboard on many Samsung phones, including the flagship S6. Uh, in a post in their corporate blog today, Samsung said the likelihood of anyone exploiting this vulnerability is low, but the risk is there, and they're planning to roll out a security policy update in the coming days. Now, is this something you think consumers should be worried about? Not, I mean, yes and no. Of course, you should be aware of any security breaches on your devices and the software that you use, and be and be ready to update your phone when needed. But the use case for this particular breach is so specific. I mean, basically, it requires the user needs to be connected to a comprom compromised network. So it's got to be like a spoofed Wi-Fi network that, where the hacker has the right permissions to do stuff. And then on top of that, it actually needs to only happen during a language update to the keyboard at that specific time. So the chances of an average user having this happen to them is really slim, but it's good to see Samsung getting in front of it and saying, hey, we found it. We're sending out this update. Be, be aware of it. If you've got a phone with Knox, which is their uh, kind of security protection layer, um, here's what you need to worry about. If you have a phone without Knox, here's, here's what you can expect. Um, and that open transparency is really the only way deal with an issue like this. But I don't think it's something that that everybody with a Galaxy needs to worry about. Right. And then they, uh, you don't really need to do anything to get an update. Or do you have to have turn on updates on your phone? Well, yeah, you should have updates turned on. You should be aware of when, you know, when when the update, when you get the little notification, there's an update that needs to be um, applied. Uh, it looks as if the users um, with uh, with the Knox, users of the, that have Knox on the security level don't need to, it'll just be over the air and it'll happen automatically. Um, and then the users without Knox, uh, they're working on a fix as of now. And so that hasn't rolled out as of yet. And SwiftKey pointed out on their blog, this is not a problem in their standalone apps. This is just the one that was pre-installed on these particular yeah. Samsung phones. Yeah, as the, as the SwiftKey blog post goes into more detail, but basically they, you know, they provide the word prediction uh, engine for Samsung's keyboard via an, uh, via an SDK, a software developer kit. Um, and so it looks as if the vulnerability happened within Samsung's implement implementation of SwiftKey's SDK. So yesterday we reported the departure of several key Microsoft executives, two of whom had come over when Microsoft acquired Nokia's devices and services business last year. And today The Verge reports that Nokia is returning to the phone business. But according to a deal with Microsoft, Nokia can't use its brand on its phone until 2016. I think you're going to need to explain 
how this works. They're just licensing the Nokia name. What are they doing? Yeah, Nokia just really can't get out. They just can't quit. Um, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna license their own name on these. It's kind of like how Polaroid. You know, Polaroid used to be a camera that was out there, and it was a company and did all stuff like that. And then they sold it to I believe Kodak or whomever. But they continued to make Polaroid uh, cameras where they licensed the name Polaroid and used it from there on, on top of hardware that they didn't create. Um, it's really tricky and weird and and legal and and all that sort of stuff with the deal, but it's not 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 unheard of. Um, in fact, you know, they've released uh, earlier, they released the, uh, a tablet with the Nokia name where they are in fact licensing the, the name Nokia from Microsoft. So yeah, that was the M1 tablet and it yep. runs Android. Did, have you tried that? I have not tried it. Um, I, I heard about it. I, I kind of laugh at this because I feel like you know Nokia used to be this gem of uh, a, of a cell phone manufacturer. Now, like ten plus years ago, I remember everybody wanted a Nokia, and they were huge in you know Europe and Scandinavia and that sort of thing. And like BlackBerry, Nokia has kind of become this laughable kind of relic of the past. And I kind of feel bad when I see them trying to do stuff because they want to get back in the game so badly. Um, but they do have a brand value. They do have an established user base of people who look to them for devices. So if they're looking for creative ways to get a around this deal or after Microsoft acquired them to do other stuff, um, then good for them. And I, I wish them the best of luck. And honestly, you know, 20, it's Q4 2016 is when uh, they get the rights back. So that's not that far off. So it looks as if they're just, you know, they're, they don't want to sit idly by. So it makes sense. So you're going to stick around, right, Ron? Sure. Okay. Well, coming up, Twitter's top secret project, Lightning, and would you 3D print your face? But first, a word from today's sponsor, Blue Apron. We all love to eat, but it's hard to find a meal that doesn't compromise somewhere. Good value, quick to prepare, healthy and delicious. That's where Blue Apron comes in. Blue Apron makes cooking delicious meals easy and fun. They deliver fresh, ready-to-cook meals right to your door. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron sends you fresh ingredients, perfectly proportioned, with step-by-step -step recipe instructions, including beautifully printed pictures. It makes cooking healthy meals easy and fun. No trips to the grocery store and no waste from unused ingredients. Blue Apron is perfect for date night, cooking with friends, and they even offer a family plan with kid-friendly ingredients so the whole family can eat well and have fun preparing the meals together. Each balanced meal is 500 to 700 calories per serving. Cooking takes half an hour. Shipping is free and the menus are always new. They won't send the same meal twice. They work around your schedule and dietary preferences, and Blue Apron's experts source only the best seasonal ingredients for incredible meals like seared steaks and mashed potatoes and paneer and vegetable katie rolls with tamarind date chutney. You'll cook incredible meals and be blown away by the quality and the freshness. Blue Apron is the better way to cook. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com twit. That's right, two free meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Tonight. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. 9 to 5 Max Mark Gurman posted a few Apple Watch 2 rumors today, including the possibility of a video camera in the top bezel of the watch that would allow you to use it for FaceTime. Uh, now, Ron, it's, I know that you're an Android guy, but have you heard anyone asking for a video camera in any smartwatch? No, no, I mean, and, and that's the thing. I'm not surprised. I mean, because, you know, I, I was just saying a couple of weeks ago, I saw somebody using FaceTime like in public, like on the street. And I was like, wow, does anybody actually do that? Like, does anybody actually use FaceTime as they're walking to have a conversation? And not many people do. I mean, I'm I'm often in San Francisco and New York City. I don't see people using that. I can't imagine people walking through the city while having a conversation on their watch. And no, I, I, I get why they're going to do this, but I don't think it's anybody, anything anybody's clamoring for. Right. It is in all the movies the future that's what it's, we always imagine doing but it's the dream of the dick tracy watch that's what it is so <laughs> right i mean i still have uh i'm still a little bit embarrassed to pay with my watch i'm getting over that um today i was shopping in a store who just got like a payment system they just got square or some kind of ipad payment system and i made a joke you know asking if i could pay with my watch and they were just seemed terrified by this <laughs> so <laughs> i i think it's just that you know it's this is the normal people aren't doing all these things with their watch Yet. Yet. And that's the key word is yet, is that we are, it's so, this is the first batter of the first inning of the of the wearable watch kind of revolution and that sort of thing. And and I honestly, I don't think Apple or Google with, with Android Wear have figured it out yet. I don't think that they're perfect. Every The majority of the people that I talk to that um, have bought Apple watches and a lot of people I talk to who have bought Android Wear watches, they say, yeah, it's neat. It's cool, but you don't need it. It's not, it's not absolutely mandatory. Like it's not, it's not the key thing that helps me run my life better. Right now, 
now it's just kind of a fun little add-on if you can afford it. So Right. I mean, I think of that about most technology. I don't think yeah. you really need any of it. Even the iPhone, which I think, you know, or, you know, anyone's smartphone, you'll say, oh, I can't live without it. And sometimes I feel like I can't live without it. But the truth is, I probably could live without it. Well, I mean, I mean, I think I think both of us remember the time before these phones and uh, we lived without them. So it's <laughs> it's 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 just a, it's how you are able to deal with the lack of technology in your life. But that said, it does enrich it and does make it better. And I love my I mean, I've got an Android Wear watch and I love it. I, it's great for running and for when I'm commuting and, and out on the go. I don't need to take my phone out of my pocket. But basically, it's just an extension of your fo phone at this point. It's not truly an independent device. Right. I mean, I love mine too. And I, I think the other thing that these people that I scared them asking to pay with my watch, they said, you know, the next, the next thing it's going to be embedded into our face. <laughs> I think that that is what the one thing that scares people, I think, like this is just the first step to, you know, robots taking over the world through our skin yeah. somehow. So potentially <laughs> if, if Google has anything to say for it, they will. <laughs> True. <laughs> Now, uh, Apple, Mark Gurman sources also said that they're looking to create a watch in the 1000 to 10000 price range. Uh, and you pointed me to a story on CNET about how wearable devices are expected to surge 173% this year, which kind of goes with what we were talking about. That's according to market researcher IDC. Uh, so I guess, you know, like we just said, this is going to be the next thing. Uh, and you mentioned that you use your Android Wear for running. And I think that that's what I hear a lot from the Apple Watch. That's, you know, my favorite thing is the thing that, you know, it tracks my calories. It reminds me to stand up and exercise. Uh, and Fitbit, also um, a big company in this space, had a big IPO today. Uh, and that was despite the fact that an analyst said the IPO price was already in the heightened range. So I think we maybe are headed towards, you know, wearables for, for everyone. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the Fitbit um, IPO today is just a sign of the direction. And that's, I mean, that's a great story. I mean, that company, I remember when they launched, I think they launched at one of the startup kind of conferences, uh, like a TechCrunch Disrupt or something like that a few, few years ago, to see them now get to the point of IPO and be this big, huge company with all these different products. Um, I think the fitness sector is going to be one that's going to grow a lot over the next couple of years, thanks to wearables. Um, and then once, you know, Apple and Google and Fitbit and, and other companies figure out how to integrate wearables as well into our lives in ways other than fitness, um, I think this sector is just going to keep on growing. And I think that, you know, we're, we're seeing this big surge in sales, that 173% increase um, that IDC reported, purely because more is on the market now. You know, we saw a, a flood of Android Wear devices. We see the Apple Watch, we see stuff like that. But I mean, I don't think they're going anywhere. So even though we might haven't figured out how to make them crucial in our lives, they're going to be on the shelves for a while. Yeah. And so now you, you said you used it for running. Do you track yep. your workouts? Do you, do you use it to track daily things in your life? Yeah, yeah, I use Google Fit, and so I, you know, I track my run, I track my when I go to the gym, the stuff I do there. I, I'm not super. Um, a friend of mine, Veronica Belmont, she's super. Uh, she tracks everything and uses all those analytics and all those numbers and looks at everything. I'm not that crazy about it. I'm not looking at every calorie and every step and everything like that. But I like to have some insight into what my activity is doing and how it's affecting me on, a, uh, you know, from a data standpoint. Yeah, it was a really uh, interesting. I heard you guys having a discussion on uh, Tom Merritt's show, Daily Tech yep. News Show. Uh, you and Tom and Veronica all had a different opinions about why you wear wearables and what you use yeah. them. And it's interesting because uh, I have all this data and I don't really know what to do with it. I mean, I would like to track yeah. and figure out what it means, but I'm not even really sure how. I think that's that's the next step. If someone could tell me how to use this data and you know make it improve my life instead of just seeing it, that would be more helpful. And that, that's the key. Yeah, I don't know what the hell to do with it either, but <laughs> I'll figure it out someday. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's better to have it than not. So yeah. Right, <laughs> yes. So BuzzFeed managed to score an interview with Dick Costolo just 48 hours before the former Twitter CEO stepped down. During the interview, Costolo revealed Project Lightning, a curated content platform designed to cover live events. Now, this is meant to appeal to Twitter addicts and the people that are logged out and potential users who aren't even signed up for Twitter. Uh, do you think it has the potential to grow this audience? I, I think it's. I think this is really interesting because when you look at the use of Twitter in and around events, I mean things like the Oscars, the Golden Globe Awards, the Tonys, you know, those big kind of temple, the Super Bowl, the you know, uh, uh, any sort of you know, the, just recently we had the basketball finals, you know, the Golden State Warriors won, um, you know, any sort of those things. 
my Twitter stream becomes a flood of some people commenting about it and some people not commenting about it. Um, so what I think Lightning is really interesting is harnessing that interest in those individual events. And if you look at it, there's something going on every day. There are music festivals, there's E3, there are, you know, there's technology things, there's there's comedy festivals, there's all these sort of you know real world live events that are happening that not everyone can attend. And so I think Twitter really you know creating a product that can help harness the buzz about those events and let people everywhere participate in them is a smart idea. Um, you know, and really it's kind of, you know, I, I think Twitter has seen things like Follow Friday and Throwback Thursday and these hashtags emerge um, not by anybody related to Twitter. It's all been user generated, um, which is one of the things that speaks to how great the platform is. But also Twitter kind of loses out when it comes to managing that content. So if they, if this lightning product can emerge and help them, you know, kind of, you know, get a lasso around uh, um, event related tweets and put it in a way that speaks to Twitter, you know, Twitter user base as well. The, they kept on stressing that you don't have to be logged in to use this. And it's like, OK. Like, but don't you want me to log in? Like, isn't your whole thing that you want user growth? That's that's kind of confusing. But I think it's neat. I think it's an interesting direction, and we'll see if it works. Right. Well, I mean, whenever I see something like this, it always it, it makes it reminds me of how much we get to pick and choose the news that we see now, which I find yep. a little scary. I mean, it's great. You know, you can see what you want and not what you don't want. But I mean, I think you know, today we saw the events in South Carolina that were you know horrible, and I got a, a alert on my phone, on my watch that said, you know, this, there was a shooting and then it was the option to dismiss or I don't want to see stories like this anymore. And yeah. it was really, cause it was just like, wow, like I don't want to see stories like that. I don't want that to happen, but we need to see things like that. So I think the more we get to pick and choose what we see and what we don't see, it's a little frightening, I think. Well, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I like. I mean, I'm a, I'm of the on the opposite camp. Not to not to disagree with you, but like I I have stopped watching the news. I've stopped reading the newspaper. I've stopped doing any sort of um, controlled media because I really dislike the direction it's taken in the past 20 years. We're towards this like um, this environment of sensationalism and fear and all this sort of stuff that you know it's really I think it's created this world where now kids are afraid to go out when you can still go outside. It's still the world is generally a safe place. Yes, horrible things happen, but horrible things always happen. Now I'm relying on Twitter and Facebook and things like that. I'm relying on the people who I trust in my network to filter the news of things that are relevant to me. So of course, when something horrible like what happened, you know, um, in, in the South happened. I hear about it. I know about it. I can go read about it. Um, but I don't need to have every little sensationalist bit of news thrown at me. I can just see the things that are relevant to the interest of me and people who I trust. And I kind of like that better. You're right. I mean, horrible things yeah. do happen yeah. every day. And, you know, you could kill yourself watching them all the time. Yeah. I mean, it would be painful. So I I, I agree with you there. It's, it's interesting. But I, a story like this, when I see, you know, yeah. oh, this is a way to get you know more people on Twitter, but it's also another way that, you know, we have to make sure that we're the ones still controlling the media, not you know letting us it control well, us. That, and that's the thing. I mean, I mean, the, 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 the medium is the message, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing is that like, you know, whoever you're relying on the curation of your content, you know, like if, if Twitter lightning comes by and, and, and it's this curated thing, but it's pushing one agenda or pushing one, you know, kind of dominant kind of voice, you know, it, it, that might turn me or you off, you know, like, so it, it depends on who you trust to kind of gather that. And Twitter is trusting that their user base will be the ones to bring relevant information. But it, we all know it just takes one negative person with a loud voice to ruin the party for everyone. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because yeah. it says it says it'll be curated. But then, you yeah. know, we also say it's based on what people are tweeting about. So I don't yeah. I wonder if it's curated by people or just, you know, the crowd. Yeah, it'll be, cur it'll, it'll be curious to see what happens. And I, I want to watch to see how this product evolves. And actually, it's funny because I would actually like the inside out version of this product because I would like my regular Twitter stream to be, that's why I love TweetDeck and, and I use a talent on Android um, because I like to filter stuff out. Like I, you know, like I just don't care about whatever sports ball game is going on. So I don't want to see any tweets about that, you know? <laughs> so um, it'll be interesting if there's a more aggressive way to kind of do the opposite side of this and, and give you a event free stream. Um, but who knows? I doubt that. So the next web reports that the FCC voted three to two today to greenlight an extension of the U.S. government's Lifeline program. Lifeline is a discount phone service program for qualifying low-income consumers that's been around since 1985. In 2005, the program began to provide subsidies for prepaid wireless service plans and will seek comments on how to expand the fund to cover broadband service. So now I have a big, very important, my most important question for you, Ron. Would okay. you 3D print your face? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Good to know. According to Fast Company, a New York-based plastic surgeon has developed the technology to 3D print your face to see what your new nose might look like if you wanted one. Uh, a miniature model will cost you $60 if you change your mind, and a life-size replica goes for around $300. I, I, <laughs> Can you tell me that that is not the most horrifying thing you've ever seen? <laughs> Look at that. Oh, man. It is horrifying. I'm fascinated for some reason I can't explain with all 3D printing stories. Um, but th this one, I don't, it's, it's interesting. There was a related one where people will, uh, you're able to take an ultrasound and uh, 3D print what your baby will look like which is also a little bit creepy. I think the story I read, it was designed especially for a, a woman who was blind so she could feel what her baby would feel like. So it's not as creepy. Well, or she could just wait for her baby. <laughs> That's true. I mean, like, I don't, why do we need to 3D print the ultrasound to see what the baby's going to feel like when the baby's just going to come out eventually? <laughs> just, Good point. Because we have yeah. no patience. That's why. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I get the I get the use of the in the plastic surgery standpoint. It's like, okay, this is what you're going to look like you know, when after we do this procedure. But the idea of just 3D printing your face for 60 bucks so you can have it on your desk like a knickknack is just weird. But uh, <laughs> Well, I, don't, I think this is just to see, like, if you're going to get some augmentation. Sure. They, they talked about noses, other augmented parts of your body that you could augment if you wanted to, just to see what they looked like. <laughs> you know, it's funny going back to the news. I was at the gym this morning on Good Morning America. The, 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 I was listening to a podcast that I can avoid the TV. And there was a whole segment on the increase in plastic surgery and all this kind of sensationalism around plastic surgery. And I'm not surprised to even hear that 3D printing is being used by it. It makes sense. It's technology. So. Right. Yes. Uh, women are also uh, getting plastic surgery on their fingers, I read, so that when they um, get engaged, their hands look prettier uh, with their uh, engagement ring on Instagram. Are you ever going to come back, Ron? Did I, did I just... Was this that too world. Much? This world. No, it's not your fault. It's, okay. No, it's not your fault, Megan. I don't, I don't blame you for the, the ills of our society as we hurtle towards doomsday. <laughs> it's true. Well, with that, Ron, thank you so much for joining us. Ron is, of course, the host of All About Android, which is Tuesday. You can watch it live at twit.tv and then click on the live button. Uh, what else are you working on? Uh, working on some stuff that I'm not ready to announce. So, but uh, go to about.me slash ronxo and you can follow me on Twitter and Google Plus and Instagram and all that fun stuff. And when I've got news, you will hear all about it. Well, thank you so much, Ron. Take care. Thanks. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. You can also write directly to me, Megan, at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. Just go to our brand new website, twit.tv, and then click on the live button. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.